Welcome to the Alito Bearcats Coaches Show Podcast, a presentation of Real Country 92.1 Hank FM. Live from Blue Rays of New Orleans in Hudson Oaks, the Alito Bearcats Coaches Show Podcast is brought to you by H5 Sports Barn in Alito and Hiley Mazda of Fort Worth. And now, with head coach Robbie Jones, here's the voice of the Bearcats, Kevin Longquist. So it's going to be a 46-yard attempt for Crawford, which would be a career best for him. Inside of seven minutes, snap, placement, kick on the way, and it is good! A career best, 46 yards for Cole Crawford. And the rest of the story on that is that I had said previously, a few moments leading up to Robbie Jones trotting his kicker out there and Cole Crawford saying, I don't know if he has the real distance for this. And so shows you what I know. But we welcome you to the uh, Alito Coaches Show podcast here at Boo Rays of New Orleans. I'm Kevin Lonquist, pleased to be joined by head coach Robbie Jones. Boo Rays celebrating their 20th anniversary. In fact, they're going to be celebrating their 20th anniversary this coming Thursday. So congratulations to them. They have three locations that are going to be here in uh, Hudson Oaks, as well as Lake Worth and down in Crowley. Uh, next week, our podcast is going to be coming to you from Boo Rays of New Orleans here in Hudson Oaks next Tuesday, the 17th. Not Monday, but next Tuesday, the 17th, because of Alito's homecoming. It, it is parade day for them on that. And, of course, we want to thank our sponsors in participating in this year's podcast will be H5 Sports Barn and then, of course, Highly Mazda in Fort Worth. Always, we start the first segment with Alito head coach Robbie Jones. Our second segment will be joined by linebacker Chase Wilbur. The Bearcats get to one and one and they open up District 35A play at seven o'clock Friday at Brewer out of White Settlement. The pregame show is at 6:30. Bearcats are coming off of what I would call an opportunistic 37-27 victory over Lancaster. And coach, let's start there. A review of the film. You and I were talking before we started recording this podcast. I think 19 points from your special teams units. Either they actually scored or they led to those points, and that's the difference in the game on on Friday night. Yeah, and we felt like the week before the difference in the game was how poorly we played on special teams. So, you know, it was a big 180 for us and uh, making big, big plays on special teams, you know, pinning them down on the one to get the the safety and then, you know, the, the Crawford kick. You know, he's, he's made – 52 yarders plus uh, in practice. So uh, we felt like he had a chance to make that, and we wanted to get him out there and give him an opportunity, and he made the most of the opportunity. And, and, you know, when you looked at the film with your team on Saturday following Lancaster, what was different for all the right reasons than the previous week from Denton Geyer beyond the special teams? You know, uh, I, I think Ray had a better game. Uh, that was one of the big things was, you know, uh, we got to see Ray – uh, make some plays, and, and he did a really good job running the football. Uh, we took care of the ball for the most part. We did have a couple of picks, but uh, we did a good job of taking care of the football. And then the defense played lights out. Yeah. Uh, that was a really good offense, very talented offense that we were facing. And I felt like our defense played uh, a really, really good game. You know, speaking of which, with uh, your quarterback situation, of course, all the Alito fans know that uh, no Gavin Beard uh, at quarterback on Friday against Lancaster. It's an injury situation. You will know more later this week as to his status. So you started sophomore Nash McElroy, who had gotten a lot of snaps throughout the course of spring ball and fall camp. Saw him a lot, quite a bit, during the inter-squad scrimmage uh, in the middle of August. And so when you knew this was going to be the case, more than likely on Thursday, to, to what extent did the game plan change for Lancaster? You know, it, it, it what became basically uh, rely heavy on the run. Uh, we didn't want to put a whole lot on his shoulders. Uh, we do a lot of RPOs, so the RPOs, we tried to simplify those a little bit. So it was a, a little simpler game plan than what we had expected to go into with. So, you know, we did try to simplify a little bit, but we still, you know, stayed with the same stuff because, you know, Nash, you know, even though he was the JV quarterback, he still was taking uh, number two reps with the varsity during practice. So he was getting a lot of reps. So he, he was familiar with the game plan. So we didn't change just a whole lot. Uh, we just tried to make it to where, hey, let's take a little bit of pressure off this kid, you know, mm -hmm. and, and manage the game with how we were calling the game. And it was kind of like from all the throws that he made that there were going to be high percentage completion or high completion, high, high percentage attempts. And that seemed to be mission accomplished, at least from the approach. Right. Yeah, that was by design. You know, Coach Williams did a good job of, of putting him in situations to make him successful. 
you know, we did get into some third and longs, and those third and longs, you know, kind of got, you know, hey, uh, you know, you got to be on time with certain things and, and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that led to a couple of, you know, the, the interceptions. But, right. uh, you know, and, and that was, you know, uh, he, he tried to force one ball, you know, uh, the other one got tipped, you know, mm-hmm. so, you know, just some misfortunes there. So overall, uh, after all that, just how do you think he handled everything and just kind of getting the butterflies out of his system after the first series or two? Yeah, I think he handled it well. You know, he he settled down, you know, and we, we told him before, hey, look, you don't have to do anything special. Just go be Nash McElroy and uh, guide the offense and do what you can to help us win the football game, but you don't have to win it yourself. And you talked about how the running game, even on the pregame show visit with me uh, last Friday about how you all were going to be or had to be running the football effectively in that game and you got that Ray Guillory with 172 yards and and three touchdowns Caden Wingfield added the score at your first score of the games so you all played to your strengths in that one and I would imagine that's kind of what you were hoping for is that of course that's Alito's bread and butter in offense over the years anyway. Yeah, I mean, that's been what we've hung our hat on for, for all these years is hey, we, we're able to go run the football and then we throw the ball when we want to throw the football, you know, and, and that was a big key to uh, Friday night's game was, you know, the fact that we were having some success with the run game. You touched on this just a few moments ago about Ray, and, and that was what do you think the difference was in just the way he ran against Geyer than what you saw from him on Friday against Lancaster? I think he wanted to show uh, on that stage, you know, uh, against the Lancaster defense, you know, what kind of running back he is. And and he did a good job of that. I don't think we've seen the best Ray Guillory yet this year. Uh, I think the best is yet to come with him because he still, you know, is not, you know, I wouldn't think 100% right now uh and and we talked about it today the fact that hey we need to make sure that in practice we're hitting top speed you know two three times you know during practice getting some some more running in because you know he was laid up with that injury for about six seven uh, months right and uh he's just a month maybe two months you know into being able to go out and run and so he's not he hasn't gotten his full speed back yet and uh when that comes he's going to be dangerous is it a case where he's still building into game shape as well how do you see that yeah i mean he's he's still building into game shape right now he you know we can't leave him out there more than five six plays in a row right now uh, and then we got to get him out whereas you know when he gets into game shape, he's going to be out there for a 10-play drive and, and be able to finish the drive off. That's why, you know, Winkfield got that first touchdown was. Right. Ray was out there, had carried the ball, I don't know, three or four times, mm-hmm. and we knew he was gassed, and we got him off the field, and then Winkfield uh, took advantage of that and scored the first touchdown. Same thing at, toward the end of the ball game where you had Caden in as your primary ball carrier and that was the case too with just making sure that Ray had enough tread on the tires for that game I would presume right yeah he he was uh pretty much finished uh at that point in the game Mm -hmm. uh and so we just uh went with Winkfield there towards the end of the game all right let's switch over to the defense another solid outing kept their running game in check remember uh you know Isaiah uh, Jones had or Isaiah Lee rather he had 121 yards I think against North Crowley you all held him to 70 but really he didn't get going until maybe a stretch in the third quarter, and that was about it. His 13-yard touchdown run, uh, one of their touchdowns. But I think the way you all did that to him, kind of shutting him down and neutralizing him to a great extent, put a lot of pressure on Carter Jones, their quarterback. You kind of also made their offense a little bit more dink and dunk as opposed to the athleticism that they have where they can try, or at least they want to do big verticals. And with the exception of the 79-yarder to Emmanuel Choice, what was your overall assessment of what you saw? Yeah, I thought our defense did a great job. Uh, you know, that's another thing we hang our hat on is stopping people's run game. Uh, and that we did a really good job of that, you know, on his touchdown run. I think we had a missed tackle. Uh, but uh, we did a really good job of, of containing him for the most part. You know, we limited him, you know, to – what did you say, 70? 70 yards total. 70 I think yards would, total. You right. know, so that, that's big because that's a really good running back, you know, similar to what we did uh, with the kid from uh, Forney in the semifinal game when we held him to 42, I think it was. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and he had been going for 200 against everybody else. So uh, that just shows, you know, we're pretty good up front defensively and uh, we got to continue to improve. Uh, but – uh, I feel really good about how our defense is playing right now. Yeah, you should. They've been the, the pressure that they put on uh, Carter Jones. Three sacks, couple of hurry, couple of hurries. I think you already have fourteen hurries for the course of the season. So, but you know those numbers may not be so 
I don't know, they don't light up a stat sheet, but I think the overall thing was that you kept him under duress where he had to make decisions a little bit earlier than maybe he wanted to, if they want to call that flinching, that sort of thing. And so beyond that, you also handled their speed because you kept talking about how this was going to be the fastest team that your squad was going to face in 2024, at least for the, for the regular season. Yeah, I think we handled the speed pretty well. You know, the, the one long pass, you know, that speed kind of showed up, you know, because mm -hmm. that guy got behind us and we weren't catching him. Uh, and then also, you know, on some of uh, our longer runs uh, where Ray normally runs away from everybody, you saw those guys catching up with him, mm -hmm. you know. So that showed, you know, how fast they were. Uh, and then also, you know, you, you mentioned the, the pressures that we're getting. We're getting a lot of those pressures with just our front four. Mm -hmm. We're not having to send linebackers. So when you can do that, that allows us to have seven guys in coverage, which helps out the coverage, you know, helps the secondary out the fact that they got linebackers helping them uh, in that coverage, and you get all the pressure with the front four. And you talk about having only to rely on your – or needing to rely on your front four to create the pressure. One stat that we talked about during the game was – size differential between your front and the Lancaster offensive front. 69 pound difference. They were averaging about 315 pounds across the board. Of course, I think one of their alignment kind of tipped the scales a little bit heavier in that reaction. I think he was like 360 or 380. But you guys going 246 across the board there. And so the fact that you're surrendering that kind of size or that mass, if you will, to start it's a challenge, but you guys always seem to find a way to manage through that. Is that a quickness thing? Is it a technique thing in order to try and beat that? Or how do you see that? Uh, our kids are strong. Uh, you know, our kids uh, work hard in the weight room. So, you know, they go up against guys that are bigger than them, but they can hold up because they can squat, you know, 500, 600 pounds. So their legs are strong enough to, to withstand all that. And then plus, you know, all of our guys up front can run pretty well. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're fast. They can uh, get around those big guys and put pressure on the quarterback. As you prepare for Brewer, as we kind of look toward the, the Bears here in just a few moments, uh, if you don't think you're going to have Gavin Beard, how much will you be able to turn Nash McElroy loose? If, and I might say that a little bit kind of tongue-in-cheek in some respects. But if you think – you know, and even and that might be the case where if you don't have Gavin for the next couple of weeks, to what extent can you put on what can you put on Nash's shoulders to kind of maybe expand what he can give you in the offense? I think we can we can open up the offense a little bit more this week with him. You know, uh, last week with it being his first varsity, you know, experience, we we were kind of hesitant to uh, turn the ball over to him and let him you know just you know make play after play after play, which he has the ability to do. So, uh, you know, we have a, the confidence in him to where he can go out and uh, we can do our entire playbook with him, you know. So we expect to, to be able to throw the ball a lot more this week, you know, and then also, you know, possibly use him uh, in the run game a little bit. Okay, so that – and, of course, he has two pretty good targets to throw to between Caden Finley and Jamal Hollister, who's still – and I, I want to ask you real quickly about Jamal because, obviously – it's a little bit of a slow start for him, but I would imagine, too, for him, still trying to understand everything of how this offense works, all the wide receiver responsibilities. What is he seeing, and what are you seeing from him in these first two games? Yeah, I mean, he, he's still learning quite a bit, you know, of our offense. Uh, but, you know, he's been kind of his own worst enemy because, you know, his big catch in the Geyer game, he fumbled it at the end, so he didn't get those uh, receiving yards. Right. And then he had a catch uh, the other night, and – he didn't line up correctly, which uh, resulted in a illegal formation penalty on us. So, you know, he's uh, taken away some of his uh, catches. I got you on that. Okay, so let's look ahead to Brewer. Again, 7 o'clock kickoff over in White Settlement. Uh, they're 0-2 this year. They open up the season with a loss to Saginaw, and you might r raise your eyes, eyes at Saginaw, but Saginaw is actually 2-0 and this year. They beat Boswell the other night, and then uh, Brewer lost to Lake Dallas uh, last week. What's your overall assessment of Jason Wheeler's team? Uh, you know, they played uh, two pretty good teams. Uh, you know, Saginaw is a lot better than what people are, are going to give them credit for. Uh, Coach Peters has done a really good job over there. You know, and then Lake Dallas has historically had some pretty good football teams. So, you know, they weren't playing just some, some weak sisters or anything like that. But, you know, they're, they're kind of young, uh, mm -hmm. Brewer is, you know. Uh, and what I've noticed about Brewer over the last couple of years since we've been playing them is, you know, they, they've got the open enrollment. So they get a lot of kids that come in and play for them for a little while, and then they're gone. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, they had a defensive tackle that started for them the last two years, his freshman and sophomore year. And then uh, when I started watching video, I was like, okay, where's this kid? Uh, and then I look at their roster, and he's no longer on their roster. Mm -hmm. You know, So I tried to do some research and find him, and he's in DeSoto now. Okay. Uh, so 
you know, they've had some issues with kids, you know, leaving their program and, and things like that. So uh, Coach Wheeler does a really good job. He's got a really good staff over there. They they get those kids to playing hard, you know. But right now he's playing a lot of sophomores. Gotcha. You know? So that's going to be one of those things where they're going to have to probably – and this was kind of like last year's uh, regular season finale. It's it's It kind of mirrors itself a little bit because if Nash McElroy goes – that's kind of like what you had last year when Gavin Beard had to start when Haas was out with the groin injury. And so, but given the fact that you have that kind of strength and physicality with your team, I mean, if everything goes the way it should, you all should be pretty well okay. At least I'm sure you would like to think so. Yeah, well, you'd like to think so. You know, uh, I, I feel like we'd be in good hands if uh, Nash does play quarterback again this week, you know, and then we also, you know, have been working uh, Lincoln Tubbs at some quarterback as well. You know, mm -hmm. Lincoln, we moved him to receiver this year. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the starting JV quarterback first game of the year last year. Lincoln broke his collarbone. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we moved Nash up to the JV from the freshman team. So uh, Lincoln is an option for us uh, at quarterback as well, as well as Kobe Smith. You know, so we have options at quarterback uh, that we feel good about. You know, Lincoln uh, provides a guy that can come in and, and you know, you saw it probably a little bit last week. You know, he's going to run the ball a little bit more when he's a quarterback, you know, but he still can throw the football. Now, this series with Brewer, uh, Lito leads it by a count of 18-2, to two, so it's pretty lopsided. The Bearcats have won the last 16 consecutive meetings, which is the longest streak uh, by any opponent for Alito in its history. First game was played in 1988. Alito won that game by a score of 24-7. to seven. Uh, The Brewer wins were in 1989 and 1999. Those numbers courtesy of our deacon who's sitting over to my right. So thank you for that, sir. Um, you know, when you look at this series, and again, these schools are really close to each other, probably the closest that you have of any of the teams that you'll face year after year, especially when you're in the same district. And so anything in your, you and your staff have to remind your team for things to be aware of, off the field, social media, that sort of thing, is it, or, or is it not as – or is that overplayed, do you think? You know, so, with social media, it's, it's every week. It doesn't matter that they're close, <laughs> True. you know. Right. Uh, you know, and, but I like it when other teams get on social media and kind of talk bad about us because – uh, it gives our kids a little bit more fire. Uh, we saw that last year in a playoff game. I don't want to mention who they were because I hope they do it again this year. Uh, but uh, they, they get on there and they talk a little trash uh, about us and, you know, how we're not, not, not that good or anything like that. So, you know, then our kids have something to prove. And uh, so I like it when uh, somebody gets on social media and talks some trash about us. So final question for you before we hit the break here as far as these two 6A games that you had against Geyer and Lancaster – Everything that you hope that this non-district, I mean, challenging from that standpoint, what you hoped that you and your your team got out of it. Yeah, I mean, they were both challenging games. They were, you know, playoff type games, uh, and that's what we wanted to see early on. Now, of course, we didn't like the fact that we didn't win both of them, uh, but we should have, you know, probably won both of them. So, uh, you know, we got a lot out of it. We got to see, you know, a lot of things to work on. So there's lots of room for improvement. That's what I told our guys. I said. Uh, once we get everything fixed and, and we're, you know, the team that we're capable of being, we're going to be a hard team to beat. And I was going to say, you know, Alito's so close to being a Class 6A uh, program. Remember when the realignment came out in February, I think you all were like eight students short of moving up. So the fact that you all were playing a couple of 6A teams, not as daunting as I think maybe – if you, if you look at somebody, they're going to say, holy cow, they're going to play two 6A teams, but you guys are used to this sort of thing. Right. We've played 6A teams in the past. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we even, we've played some 6A teams that end up in the 6A uh, state championship game. Right. Uh, we did that with Geyer one, one year. Uh, I think they beat us by two or three points. Then we also played Cedar Hill uh, in that COVID year because – we had somebody drop out on us. They had somebody drop out on them. So we just met up and played. Uh, we didn't even have the game scheduled until like the Tuesday of that week. Uh, so we had to do quick little game plans uh, with those guys. And, you know, I don't remember. It was maybe a touchdown mm -hmm. uh, uh, that they beat us by, you know, and then they end up in the 6A state championship. And, of course, we win that year. But, yeah, we've played some 6A uh, opponents in the past, and, you know, we've held our own against them. And curious note, I think the Deacon was telling us somewhere, like when Alito and Geyer have played each other each year, whether it's been a scrimmage or whether it's been a regular season game, that one of them has gone on to play and win the state championship. Is that right, Deacon? 
Yeah. Okay. So the fact so so the pressure is on both of you all to go down there in six A and then in five A Division One. So no yeah. pressure on that. So no, no pressure at all. All right. So coach, thanks for your time. We'll look forward to talking about Brewer next week, and of course next Tuesday, looking ahead to a homecoming against Birdville. Thanks for the all time. Right. All right. Thank you. All right. This reminder that the Alito podcast is brought to you by H5 Sports Barn. H5 Sports Barn and Knife Physio and Performance can help unlock your athletic potential and elevate your game like the Alito Bearcats with expert sports physical therapy, tailored recovery plans, and top-notch sports performance training. H5 Sports Barn, proud supporters of the Alito Bearcats. And we're also brought to you by Hiley Mazda of Fort Worth. Looking for a new ride? Hiley Mazda of Fort Worth has you covered. Right now, get 3500 off MSRP or 0% interest for 36 months on the five-star safety-rated CX-5 and CX-30. Hurry in. These offers will not last long. Experience top-notch service and unbeatable deals in their new state-of-the-art facility in Fort Worth or check out their extensive Mazda lineup at HileyMazdaOfFortWorth.com. Highly Mazda of Fort Worth, family owned and operated over for over 30 years. On the other side of this break, we'll have a few Bearcats joining us as we get ready for the District 3-5 opener between the Bearcats and the Brewer Bears. Stick around. The podcast continues after this timeout. To Guillory over the left side, trying to shake a blocker. Gets outside the numbers across the 40, 45, 50 to the 45 into Lancaster territory. Breaks a tackle. Off he goes. 30, 20. Amanda beat at the 10 with a blocker in front of him. Dives to the end zone. Touchdown, Alito Bearcats. 56 yards. Ray Guillory. And that was the third of... Ray Guillory's touchdowns as the Bearcats were able to win by a score of 37-27. Bearcat running backs were accounting for four touchdowns in that game as we're going to be speaking to the one who scored the first one, Caden Wingfield, here in just a few moments. We're also going to be joined by Chase Wilburn, junior linebacker. But first, before we do that, we're going to give you the Alito alumni report. Uh, we'll start off on the baseball side with left-hander Cody Bradford, who's with the Rangers, carrying a record of 5-2 and two with an ERA of 3.05. He has put together five consecutive quality starts, overcame an injury earlier this year, and is cementing himself to be a part of the Rangers' future starting rotation. Really good finish to his season so far for the left-hander. And then JoJo Earl uh, over at TCU. Of course, he transferred from TCU from Alabama in last week's 48-0 victory over Long Island, he had three catches for 24 yards and a touchdown. And, of course, the Horn Frogs are going to continue their season, their Big 12 opener this coming Saturday against Central Florida at Amon Carter Stadium. Okay, uh, we're going to be joined now. Now we're going to be joined by Chase Wilbur and uh, Caden Wingfield out of the backfield. Uh, guys, thanks for being with us. Appreciate your time. Yes, sir. All right, let's talk a little bit about this. I'm going to pose this question to both of you here where – uh, when you all find out that your starting quarterback is out in Gavin Beard. And so how do you kind of deal with it emotionally? Caden, I'll kind of start with you because he's the guy who's handed the ball off to you. And so it, it goes from number five to number eight in Nash McElroy. What was that like learning that and just understand that everything was going to flip uh, Thursday night going into Friday? Uh, it was shocking at first found, finding out that uh, Gavin wasn't going to be playing. But uh, I played with Nash for a little bit and I had a lot of confidence in him to come in this game and carry us to a win. Okay, and then for you, Chase, I mean, obviously other side of the ball, but of course a vital member to your team. He's handling the ball every snap. Yeah, we knew that the offense was probably going to need some help, so we knew that we had an extra responsibility on the defensive side, making sure that we kept that score low and we always gave him the ball back. Okay, and then let's talk a little bit about the, the game plan because it changed quite a bit going into it. Whatever you all were doing for Lancaster on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday kind of had a change to a certain extent because – even though you guys take a lot of pride in running the football, and that's how Alito uh, offense has been defined over the years, but it seemed like they were going to have to rely on you and, and Ray a lot more because of just kind of letting Nash get acclimated with the game. What was kind of the thought process of what you and uh, Ray were going to be doing uh, as far as the game itself was, Caden? So um, <clears throat> what we was going to do was we was going to uh, have a split back, uh, keep me and Ray alternating, keep us healthy. Uh, after Ray's injury, you know, just to keep us on the field, keep us active at the same time and just pounding the rock down people's throats. All right. I had a, by the way, I saw, I remember watching uh, Caden when he was a freshman on the freshman team. I think it was the freshman black team. That's the higher, the higher team. Is it the black or the orange is, is the higher team? Orange. 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 Okay. Thank you. So anyway, so I used to see him several times where he was Pretty darn stinking good. So they got a pretty good running back here in Caden. And, of course, a one-two punch. I want to ask you a little bit about the one-two punch that you and Ray have kind of developed in these first two weeks. What's that been like? Just, you know, he goes in for five plays and you go in for five. What's that like keeping each other fresh and then just obviously just trying to grind down opponents, that sort of thing? 
Yeah, it's real good. It keeps us both um, fresh and out, uh, keep us uh, to have our uh, air and ready to go back in, keeping us great, having enough stamina to come back in and uh, take over the game. Okay, and then for you, of course, you know, uh, what's this experience been like, though, for you? Because, you know, you got a lot of playing time last year, about 450 yards. But what's different, and what did you learn about yourself playing against two 6A defenses? I mean, that's a big jump for you, but seeing Geyer and Lancaster. But what did you learn about yourself just through these two contests? That, um, that I became a little bit better working out harder, uh, trying to push myself to become better. After uh, last year where I uh, didn't get that much playing time and didn't get to play against these 6 eight teams, I actually feel great coming in and uh, actually doing something good. What is your confidence level like right now? Uh, very high, really high. And when you scored that first touchdown uh, from about 13 yards out, they, they gave you all the, fir- the, the lead of the game, one that you all would never relinquish. But what did you see on that run? Um, I seen uh, the opening just a crease, and I was going to be able to slip in there and take off and get my first touchdown of the season. There you go. There you go. Congratulations to you on that. Okay, let's switch over to you, uh, Chase, real quickly. Played some last year. Of course, you had the pick six. I think it was against Northwest. You can correct me on that. Um, But moving up this year full-time to replace, I think it was Kai Howington. What's that adjustment been like for you? And that's really been an adjustment that you've been – uh, taking responsibility for since January when the season ended and the off season began. Yes, sir. Uh, I started a few games last year for Kai. He had that shoulder injury, but uh, really just the same mindset as I took those three games that um, I'm going to have to play a big role on the defense and that, you know, it, it's not against the twos. Because usually last year when I would go in, it was against the twos after blowout games. But now we're facing big teams. I didn't uh, – big teams against Lancaster and Geyer, so we would have to, I would have to step it up a little bit. All right, so the defense has gone against two Division One commits. That's Kevin Sperry at Geyer, who's committed to Oklahoma, and then Carter Jones at Lancaster, who's committed to Nevada. These are the numbers through these first two games from this front seven. Four sacks, 14 hurries, and probably a number of other plays where the quarterback has been under duress, having to maybe make a decision earlier than he wants to. What kind of confidence does this give you all? Because these are 6A teams that you're facing. I think it all starts with our D-line. I feel like our D-line is probably one of our best aspects of our team. With, you know, quarterback, we know after the very first drive that he's feeling our D-line and that uh, our main goal is to put his face in the dirt, really, and (laughs) uh, that they're doing a great job. And sometimes uh, me and Ben and Owen, we like to – stunt try to get after the quarterback but our main goal is get back there and get after that quarterback you know the one thing that coach jones mentioned in our first segment is the fact that because that front four doesn't need the linebackers to help bring pressure they can do it all by themselves and so what kind of freedom does that give you for owen and then obviously for ben allows us to help the secondary and play better uh better pass coverage so we can play out uh seven instead of you know five or six because we know that Elon is getting after the quarterback. And I want to ask you, too, because huge change in the secondary. Of course, you're one of the newcomers to the defense. But, of course, Adrian Fuller and Kai Taylor are the new corners. Lamel Swanson and Cameron Hall are the new safeties. And it just seems like they picked up right where they left off. And I'm sure, obviously, a great defensive line can help a secondary do a lot of great things. But what have you seen from that back four? I think the back four, they've actually they've really stepped it up. Um, they, uh, they understood that they had some big shoes to fill with uh, probably – one heck of a second they're leaving. So <laughs> One we'll never see again, yeah, right? They had some big shoes to fill, and I think they've done a great job. A uh, few plays here and there, but that's also pro- probably on all of us, really, but I think they've done a real good job. Okay, so even though I want to go back to something you said about making the few starts last year when Kai was out with the shoulder injury, because of the speed of the game, which was different than maybe when you talked about going against the twos, what did you pick up from those games that probably helped you in terms of just even helping you in your transition to becoming the full-time starter this year? I think Northwest is probably the best team that I started against and that it's a whole different speed. You know, the running backs, they're faster, they're stronger, the O-line, they're bigger, and they know how to stay on block. So really, it just my mindset throughout the whole offseason was I'm facing that all year. And so that I'm not going against the freshman team or like the backups. I'm going against uh, the Friday Night Light guys. So um, really got to focus in and take it all serious. All right, Kate, I want to ask you in terms of just, you know, you saw a lot of burn last year, like I said, about 450 yards rushing. 
What was your offseason like to get ready for this year, knowing that you were going to be one of the primary ball carriers? What was the things that you focused on with yourself physically and then just working on moves, cuts, things like that? Um, <clears throat> during the season, I worked on my footwork, uh, getting more shiftier in the backfield, working on vision, speed, acceleration, and just working on trying to get bigger throughout my body period. How much bigger are you? Um, a little bit bigger from uh, last year, gained a little bit of weight. Okay. Height wise too. How much? Uh, so tell everybody what the difference is. Height. What were you height wise and weight wise last year, and what are you this year? Uh, it's not much of a huge difference. Last year, height wise, I was five ten, five nine and a half maybe. Now I'm a uh, five eleven right now. Weight wise, I was one seventy five, mm -hmm. and then I jumped up to one seventy nine, trying to get to one eighty. Okay. Are you gonna get there? Uh, I'm already there. Oh, all right. Okay, good. All right. <clears throat> so uh, in, in terms of just, but that strength, what does that mean to you, though? Like, because when you draw that first contact and that second contact, that strength, what does that mean to you in terms of just absorbing that hit and maybe kind of delivered some, some of your own punishment a little bit? Yeah, uh, it's, it's coming in quick. Got to got to stay prepared, stay ready to get hit. And it's actually, a, actually became a big factor working out throughout the off season. All right. I'm going to ask you guys, and, and then I'll be remiss here, but at the end we'll close with something a little bit special because Cole Crawford has joined us here. Uh, I'm going to, but getting ready for the district opener on Friday at Brewer, what do you take, again, I know we spoke a little bit about what Geyer and Lancaster and what this did for you all as a team, but what does this mean, though, for you to get those games because these are the ones that really count toward the district trying to get the, you know, there's that district, that district streak that's at 195 games or whatever it is. What is it, 119? 119 Deacons. This. Okay, so that's all we got to talk about is that. But anyway, what does that mean for like just knowing that this, these are the ones that count? Geyer and Lancaster were great tests. They get you ready, but these are the ones that matter. So just talk about what this means now, changing your mindset of we got, now we got to make the push for the playoffs. I'll start with you on this, Chase. Uh, yeah, we're going to take it one week at a time. Right now we're really focused on Brewer. But also in the back of our minds, we've got two teams that were coming up, and I think didn't didn't Ryan and Richland that we have to, you know, obviously we're going to focus one week at a time, but they're definitely in the back of our minds. Yeah, and I was going to say, go ahead and give us your thoughts on that, Caden, just as far as you know, getting ready for district play. Yeah, I agree with Chase. I feel like we need to focus one week at a time, and uh, when it comes up to those games, didn't Ryan and Richland, we need to be ready, be prepared mentally. Okay, so what do you think? Okay, and that's a great point you make about Geyer and Lancaster. What do you think those two games did for you? Because knowing you're going to, because you guys played a heck of a game against Ryan last year that was, you know, decided right at the very end. And of course, Richland has two top 100. Uh, athletes there, but what did you think those two games will help you, even though these games are in October, but what do you think that those games will do, the games that you just played will mean for playing these types of opponents when the district championship is on the line? We'll start with you on that, Kate. I feel like it'll get us ready and get us prepared and uh, ready for teams that are going to be bigger and faster than we are, and I feel like starting off with Lancaster and Geyer actually helps make a big impact on us. Okay, and then for you, Chase? Playing those, team, those two teams first, uh, really let us know what kind of level ball that we'll, we'll be going up against, uh, even, you know, with Dent Ryan and Richland, but also deeper in the playoffs. So uh, we knew what level we're, we're going to have to play against and we'll, how good a football we're going to have to play. All right, and I'm going to be remiss if I didn't bring up Cole Crawford here because he was the one who kicked the 46-yard field goal in the third quarter that helped build Alito's lead, made it, made it 37-20. to 20. So... And as I told you off air, Cole, right before you kicked that, and when uh, Coach Jones brought you out there, I said, I don't know if he has the range to do that. <laughs> and, of course, Robbie tells us, all, uh, tells us that. He goes, so he's been kicking 52 yarders in practice. So, but it's different, though. I mean, kicking them in practice and then kicking it when something's on the line. So just take us through your mindset, Cole, about uh, that 46-yarder uh, going, going toward the east side of the stadium. Um, well, uh, I, like I kind of told the – communities or whatever after it's you know it's just just another kick and you know, like you said I've hit you know 52 yarders and 46 yarders and 36 yarders or whatever a billion times in practice so just trying to you know treat it like it's uh, just another kick um, you know I've practiced all that stuff a bunch and kicking is all about being composed and you know in my element so I always stay ready uh, I stand next to coach V a soccer coach and he's always got my block ready and you know there was another situation we uh, had a fourth down that we were going to the other side, and I think it was a, a little bit over 50 yards. But, you know, I'm standing there with my helmet on, all giddy, ready to go <laughs> give it a shot. But, uh, yeah, just, 
just another kick, just kind of in my element, stick to my training. You know, I've done it a billion times, so just go out there and do it again. What's that feeling like, though? Because, again, it's a new challenge for you to do this. And, of course, you had the game winner last year against Geyer. That was, was more of a chip shot of 21 yards. Right. But, but what does that one mean to you, knowing that now you have that personal history in a game of doing something like that? Because it gives them confidence that they could run you back out there if they need to, depending on a game situation. Right, for sure. This one definitely means a lot. You know, anytime you get a personal best in anything, it's really cool, memorable, uh, great feeling, and really just the overall game, you know, just being to execute. And um, that one field goal was nice, but even every little pooch kickoff and, and everything, you know, I didn't have my best game against Geyer. Um, I went in there a little overconfident. You know, God humbled me a little bit there. But yeah. um, coming out against Lancaster and being able to just do my job, you know, every play and, and, you know, being able to be a little bit more focused and having just everything go pretty good, pretty right for me is just really, really good. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm confident in myself regardless of what happened last week, next week, this week, and uh, just glad that I can, you know, give them another reason to put me out there. When you struck the 46-yarder, what were your thoughts as you were watching it travel through the air to the, uh, between the uprights? Did you think, I think it's going to get there? Well, so I, it goes off my foot, and number one thing with kicking is don't look up because if you look up before you hit it, you're going to miss. It's just like golf, you know. It's You know, you can't look up, can't get antsy, but – um, after it came off my foot, I look up and it was kind of trailing to the left and I was really hoping it was bending back and it did. And it went in, um, I didn't hit it perfectly, but you know, hit it good enough and it went in. So yeah, for a second it was going to the left and I was getting a little, a little worried, but it trailed back in and had the distance. So congratulations. Yes, Thanks sir. for Thank you. All right. And, uh, guys, again, good luck to you this coming uh, Friday night over in white settlement against the Brewer Bears. Thanks for your time tonight. Yes, sir. All right. We were happy to be joined by Caden Wingfield, Cole Crawford, and of course, Chase Wilburn here. This reminder to you that the Alito podcast is brought to you by our friends at H5 Sports Barn. H5 Sports Barn and Nye Physio and Performance can help unlock your athletic potential and elevate your game like the Alito Bearcats with expert sports physical therapy, tailored recovery plans, and top-notch sports performance training. H5 Sports Barn, proud supporters of the Alito Bearcats. We're also brought to you by Hiley Mazda of Fort Worth. Looking for a new ride? Hiley Mazda of Fort Worth has you covered. Right now, get $3,500 off MSRP or 0% interest for 36 months on the five-star safety rated CX-5 and CX-30. Hurry in. These offers will not last long. Experience top-notch service and unbeatable deals in their new state-of-the-art facility in Fort Worth or check out their extensive Mazda lineup at HileyMazdaOfFortWorth.com. Highly Mazda of Fort Worth, family-owned and operated for over 30 years. Again, the Bearcats will be continuing their season, game number three of the 2024 campaign. The District 3-5A opener is this coming Friday, 7 o'clock kickoff against the Brewer Bears. Pre-game show on 92.1 Hank FM will begin at 6.30 with Kyle Hicks, Mercedes Meyer, the Deacon, and myself. We will bring you all the action of the Bearcats, and then we will return here next Tuesday. Remember, next Tuesday, the 17th for a 7 o'clock podcast with Coach Jones and selected players because Monday is, is homecoming week for Alito High School. That's the parade. So that's why we're a day back. I'm Kevin Longquist. Thanks for joining us. We will see you all next week on the Alito Coaches Show podcast. So long, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Alito Coaches Show podcast brought to you by H5 Sports Barn in Alito and Highly Mazda of Fort Worth with Bearcats head coach Robbie Jones and the voice of the Bearcats, Kevin Longquist. Please like and subscribe to this podcast and tell a friend. You're also welcome to join us every Monday night at 7 from Blue Rays of New Orleans in Hudson Oaks. And then listen to every Alito Bearcats game home and away live on Real Country 92. 92.1 Hank FM on the free 92.1 Hank FM app or online at 921 HankFM.com.